Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is an event um, during Western's International Week, and we want to say thank you to Western International uh, for the initiative and for allowing us to take part. Um, my name is Joanna Quinn, and I'm the director of the Center for Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction here at Western. And um, this is another in our series that we've called Transitional Justice and the Law, sponsored jointly between the Faculty of Law and our Center for Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction. And the series is really intended to respond to political and social problems that are in the news and to take advantage of the expertise that we have here at Western in understanding those problems in a more in-depth way. So we put together today's panel as news continued to swirl about what was taking place in Iraq and Syria, and that conflict continues today. <clears throat> the conflict began, as you know, in 2011, or nominally began in 2011, when massive protests swept through the Syrian capital and other major cities demanding sweeping reforms to government. A month later, these demonstrations began calling for the overthrow of Assad, who responded by deploying security forces nationwide to maintain stability. Violent clashes erupted, and the opposition began to organize an armed struggle against the state. Then in 2012, <coughs> armed rebels began taking large stretches of territory and some urban centers, uh, such as Aleppo, Syria's commercial center. As the insurgency grew, however, so did the influence of jihadist organizations, such as Al-Qaeda, over the rebels' ranks. And in 2013, the head of the Islamic State of Iraq, a jihadist organization formerly known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and led by influential Sunni Muslim cleric Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, announced that he would unite his organization with Al-Qaeda's franchise in Syria, the Nusra Front, which had become one of the most powerful groups to overthrow Assad. Nusra's head, Abu Muhammad al-Julani, refused this merger, but Baghdadi's group stormed Syria anyway, branding itself as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. The entrance of ISIS signaled a new phase in the conflict. Jihadist influence became rampant among the armed opposition, and the US began to reevaluate its support of rebel groups, some of which had become absorbed into the ranks of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, bringing U.S. training and weapons with them. Former President Barack Obama shifted the focus of U.S. policy from removing Assad to battling the spread of ISIS, which had taken over a large portion of the country. And in 2014, the U.S. began conducting airstrikes on ISIS in Syria. In 2015, Russia entered the conflict, and Syria's relationship with Russia, of course, dates back to the 1970s. Moscow had politically supported Assad during the war, and Russia's intervention came at the direct request of Assad as his military and its allies stroked, struggled to cope with waves of jihadist militants. Russia's intervention marked a turning point for the Syrian army, which began to reverse years of territorial losses and retook major strategic cities such as Homs and Aleppo from ISIS and opposition groups. Now, as you can imagine, this has had a major impact in politics in neighboring Iraq, making the divisions there, and particularly for Iraqi Kurds, all the more prevalent. It's also caused the displacement of millions of people. In 2016, the United Nations, from an estimated pre-war population of 22 million, identified 13.5 million Syrians requiring humanitarian assistance, of which more than 6 million are internally displaced within Syria, and around 5 million are refugees outside of Syria. And today's panel promises to look at all of that and more. <laughs> it's your job. <laughs> OK, so we're lucky today to be joined by three very distinguished panelists. I'm going to introduce them now so we can save a little bit of time uh, later on. Immediately beside me is Professor Hannes Cerny. He's a visiting professor at the Department of International Relations at the Central European University in Budapest. And he's author of the monograph Iraqi Kurdistan, the PKK, and International Relations, Theory and Ethnic Conflict. And that's just been published by Rutledge. Among other things, he's been very closely following the events surrounding the independence referendum in Iraqi Kurdistan that was held on the 25th of September in the wider context of regional political dynamics and the role of the Kurds in the war against ISIS. 
At the end of the table is Jenny Poon, who's a PhD candidate here in the Faculty of Law, and also, I'm happy to say, in the Collaborative Graduate Program in Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction. Jenny is a specialist in both international refugee law and human rights law, and her research focuses on the principle of non-refoulement, and her work looks at how uh, the UK and Germany have interpreted the law with regard to the current refugee influx from Syria and elsewhere. In the middle is Jim Friedman, a professor emeritus who's appointed to the Center for Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction, and his book is coming out this week on uh, the ICC and the DRC, and if I may say, it's a great read, and I encourage you to have a look. Um, professor Friedman has carried out research on development issues, complex emergencies, the eco uh, economics of war, the role of corporate responsibility in conflict reduction and international legal remedies for conflict. He conducts applied policy research in the areas of governance and poverty reduction in conflict affected and fragile environments. He's completed over 60 assignments in more than 25 countries and you'll hear from all of them in turn. Um, so will you join me first in welcoming Professor Cerny. Thank you, Jan, very much for this kind introduction, and thank you also um, for having me here today. It's a great pleasure being with you and discussing these issues that are happening as we speak. Um, let me start this talk by admitting quite a bit of an error in selecting the title of the talk. Um, to the students among you, let me give you the fairly obvious career advice that it doesn't make for a smart professional move to admit at the outset of your talk that you've been utterly wrong in your political analysis. Um, but what can I say? Here we are. When Joanna asked me in mid-September to indicate a title for my talk, I could not have foreseen what happened a month later. In my defense, no analyst I know of could have predicted what happened um, at the end of October. So at least I'm in good company in my erroneous ways, and that explains um, why I had to modify the title. For what I'll be talking about today is not the interminable Iraqi Kurdistan independence debate, and until a month ago, seemingly never ending story, but how this debate came to die. For that is what the Iraqi Kurdistan independence debate is today. It is dead, finished, deceased. And we can identify even an exact date for its demise, and that is precisely the 25th of September when Iraqi Kurdistan held a referendum on its independence. That is when it died. So what we'll conduct here today is a kind of post-mortem on this debate to determine the cause and the circumstances of its death. In order to do that, we have to rewind three years um, put this out here, to the summer of 2014 when the Islamist insurgency of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria took Mosul, Iraq's second biggest city. The Iraqi army had simply cut and run, abandoning its posts and weaponry, and um, in the center of Iraq, leaving ISIS a clear path to the Iraqi capital of Baghdad. Among these areas the Iraqi army had abandoned were the so-called contested or disputed territories. These are lands with a sizable Kurdish population, but outside the nominal jurisdiction or administration of the autonomous Kurdistan region of Iraq um, that you can see here in this bright pink. Um, among them, chief among them, is the multi-ethnic oil-rich city of Kirkuk, which is hailed as the Kurdish Jerusalem in Kurdish law, um, which has the second biggest oil reserves in Iraq and a minority Turkoman population of which Turkey considers itself a protective power. So you can see why this city is so important and such a powder keg. So the Iraqi Kurds in the summer of 2014 filled the political and military vacuum the Iraqi army had left behind 
occupied Kirkuk and other contested territories and declared that they were there to stay. The president of the KRG, Masoud Barzani, allegedly back then already toyed um, with a unilateral declaration of independence, arguing that the Iraqi state had become so dysfunctional that its sovereignty was de facto no longer existent. Um, to be fair, Barzani had a point in this portrayal because one example, the Iraqi parliament was so divided that the MPs were not even able to pass a state of emergency declaration while ISIS advanced on Baghdad. Um, be that as it may, Barzani was then persuaded by then Vice President Joe Biden and Secretary of State John Kerry to not unilaterally break away from Iraq, but to give the Iraqi state one last chance under a new government that was then formed under Haider al-Abadi after the controversial and divisive Nuri al-Maliki had been forced out of office. In exchange, the Kurds got the presidency of Iraq and the U and U.S. weaponry. Um, merely a few days later, it turned out the blessing that the Iraqi Kurds did not declare independence. For in August of the same year, when Baghdad had turned out beyond its reach, ISIS turned on Iraqi Kurdistan. And this prompted the U.S. into action, who could not have tolerated Erbil, the capital where thousands of Westerners lived, um, to fall into ISIS hands, nor uh, for ISIS to commit a massacre on Iraq's Christian population, mainly the Yazidis and Chaldeans who live in the Sinjar region up there on the left of the map. Um, so it is no exaggeration to say that Erbil was saved at the 11th hour when US Air Force stopped them merely 40 kilometers outside of Erbil. Since then, Iraqi Kurdistan has proved an indispensable ally in the war against ISIS, yet Barzani had always made unambiguously clear that the tremendous sacrifices the Kurds were making would be rewarded with a referendum on its independence. And he hoped that his international partners would let the Kurds go ahead with it. Well, he was in for quite a disappointment. While the Obama administration had always been crystal clear that in its opposition to Iraqi Kurdistan undermining the territorial integrity of Iraq, the Iraqi Kurds held hopes that a disinterested, ignorant uh, Trump administration would at least remain neutral on the issue. Yet the US sided painfully clearly with the Iraqi central government and blamed the Kurds for jeopardizing the anti-ISIS coalition. Likewise, there had been a time when political analysts and Iraqi Kurdish politicians envisioned Turkey to be open to the potential of Iraqi Kurdish independence. Some even went so far as to envision Ankara playing the role of a midwife for, Turkish, uh, uh, for Iraqi Kurdish independence. <coughs> Yet that was before the Kurdish PYD and its armed wing, the YPG, established another quasi de facto state in neighboring Syria, one which to keep in check, Turkey had to militarily intervene there. It was also before the civil war with the PKK in Turkey resurfaced with a vengeance. And so in light of all this, the prospect of an independent Kurdish state um, to add to this quagmire again had become absolute anathema to it, uh, to Turkey. And uh, on the other hand, it shouldn't have come as a surprise to Washington or Ankara when the Iraqi Kurdish parliament did actually pass then a resolution after postponing it several times, as you can see, to hold a referendum on the 25th of September. Nonetheless, even then, President Erdogan reportedly believed until a few days before the referendum that Barzani was bluffing and that he would not go ahead with it. And yet, it is a legitimate question to ask why Barzani, the usually uber-cautious realpolitiker who put all the Iraqi Kurds had gained in the past three decades at risk 
by holding this referendum. Um, because to be clear, on the day the referendum was held, Iraqi Kurdistan was already independent in nearly everything but name. The degree of autonomy the Kurdistan region enjoyed exceeds all comparable cases in international relations. No other autonomous region maintains three de facto embassies in other, three dozen, sorry, three dozen de facto embassies in other countries. The president of the KRG is received in Washington as a head of state, or like a head of state. The KRG maintains its own 200,000 man strong army, the Peshmerga, and sells its natural resources on the international market. All this in defiance of the central government in Baghdad. At the same time though, the Kurdistan region enjoys a privilege no other de facto state has, the power to shape politics in the state it is still nominally part of by playing the role of kingmaker in the formation of the past three Iraqi governments or by the fact that Iraq's president was and is today a Kurd. So one could argue that the Kurdistan region has the, both, uh, has the best of both worlds which is why I have always argued that formal independence is not what Barzani is actually after. So why back in September put all these achievements at risk? All the more since Barzani has proven remarkably skilled in the past 15 years at walking the tightrope of ever wider expanding his autonomy state versus Baghdad while at the same time not antagonizing his international partners in Washington and Ankara. Um, what all the Western allies of Barzani, the US, the EU and Turkey, who exerted unprecedented pressure on him to abandon his reckless bid for a referendum failed to appreciate was a dynamic Richards and Smith have identified in an article in Third World Quarterly on the internal political dynamics of de facto states. De facto states who act as if they were independent and whose leaders derive their authority from the claim that true independence is only a matter of time and that they are the chosen ones who will guide their country to independence can only stave off their people for so long. At some point, the pressure from a public that is being fed propaganda about independence day and night to make their promises actually happen to finally walk the walk and not only talk the talk. Uh, so this pressure will become politically unsustainable. They will be pushed into a corner to give the people what they have been told is their right and no stalling tactics will do anymore. The irony is that Barzani, I would argue, had no intention of declaring independence. He wanted to use the results of the referendum as leverage to get wider concessions on autonomy from Baghdad. But he had to give his people, after three years of fighting ISIS, at least a vote. The feeling that they were in a position to make their own choices, to voice their preferences. And the West, on the other hand, feared precisely such a scenario would create a momentum of its own that no player in the region could control anymore and that would tear the fragile anti-ISIS coalition apart. Barzani used every channel at his disposal to signal to his partners in Washington, Ankara and Europe uh, that the referendum would be non-binding, that it would only be considered as a mandate for Kurdish politicians for further negotiations. So he saw the referendum as a starting point for negotiations, while the West saw it as the death blow to any potential negotiations. What all these Western politicians failed to understand was that Barzani at this point could not have canceled the referendum. That would have been political suicide. After promising it for three years and 2,000 Kurds giving their lives in the war against ISIS, he had to give his people at least the referendum because he, even he knew that independence was unachievable. But uh, the referendum that he promised day by day had to be held.
So he could not um, take that back. And so the referendum was held on the 25th of September. Uh, most controversially, the Iraqi Kurds not only voted in the three governorates of Iraqi Kurdistan proper, that alone would have been already accept unacceptable to Baghdad or to Kurdistan's neighbors or the international community, but also in the contested territories, lands over which no one but the Kurds themselves credit them with any sovereignty and which had a sizable Arab population that would never accept living in an independent Kurdish state. The results of the referendum can be summarized very quickly. 93% of the people voted in favor of independence at a turnout of 73%. Um, we still don't have a breakdown of the vote per individual governorate, and we may never have that, but it is safe to assume that mostly the Arab population in the contested territories abstained while the turnout among Kurds was close to 100%. So there we had it, an overwhelming but expected support for independence, but what do we to make of this result? We analysts expected weeks, if not months, of protracted political and military standoffs, endless saber rattling and posturing, so when Baghdad in response closed off Iraqi Kurdish airspace for all its aviation, and when Iran imposed a border blockade and Turkey threatened to do the same, all this was expected. But we were not anticipating anything decisive to happen because we argued that since both sides were clients of the US, neither Baghdad nor the KRG could afford to antagonize Washington with two provocative actions. Well, it did not come as we were expected. Um, we have to bear in mind that for more than one and a half decades now, Barzani and his Kurdistan Democratic Party, the KDP, have portrayed themselves as the architects of independence at the time of Barzani's choosing. If or when this happened remains uh, his choice. And by adopting that role and being hailed as the father of independence, the father of the Iraqi Kurdish nation, um, Barzani hoped to push his domestic rivals, mainly the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, the PUK, of the late Jalal Talabani and Goran, the other opposition party, into a corner. Both these parties favored dialogue with Baghdad on the matter rather than Barzani's unilateral brinkmanship. But as in the theory of ethnic outbidding, uh, Barzani, they could not afford to oppose a Kurdish dream of a referendum that would signal the Kurdish people's support for independence. So reluctantly, they campaigned for a yes vote, even though Goran abstained in the parliamentary vote on holding a referendum, even though they knew that one of the reasons why Barzani had staged the referendum, among the ones I've already discussed, was that he hoped for a landslide victory in parliamentary elections scheduled for the 1st of November for his KDP at their expense. Um, their moment of breaking free from this straitjacket that Barzani had forced them in came on the weekend of the 14th and 15th October when the Iraqi army took position outside of Kirkuk. As I've said, we all expected this to result in a lengthy but uneventful standoff. Yet what happened, and what no one did foresee, was that the PUK struck a secret deal with the Abadi government in Baghdad and simply abandoned its positions in Kirkuk. When Barzani realized that he had been betrayed and that he stood alone against the full might of a well-equipped and battle-hardened Iraqi army, 
he gave the order to withdraw too, so that on the 16th of October, the central government, okay, yeah, yeah, go back to the map, uh, so that on the 16th of October, the central government could reinstate its role over Kirkuk with barely a shot having been fired in that contest. Yet the Iraqi Kurds not only withdrew from Kirkuk, but from most of the contested territories they had occupied since 2014. In other words, Iraqi Kurdistan, over the course of just two days, and largely, largely due to political machinations concocted in the PUK base of Soleimania, in Baghdad and in Iran, lost 40% of its territory. Pretty much all that you can see in pink here and is today reduced again to just the three main governorates um, constituting the Kurdistan region. In hindsight, um, when one is always wiser, a secret deal between the POK and Baghdad should not have come as such a surprise. After all, partisan betrayals of what you may call the Kurdish common cause have a long history in the Kurdish past. In the civil war of the 1990s, for example, Masoud Basani once famously called on Saddam Hussein to assist him in retaking Erbil from the PUK. And yet the magnitude of what happened two weeks, uh, by now, yeah, three weeks ago, and its repercussions still remain absolutely baffling and none of us really knows what to make of it yet. That cataclysmic betrayal and defeat buried any hopes for the Iraqi Kurds to negotiate with Baghdad from a position of strength, let alone to translate the referendum results into an actual declaration of independence. The events of the past month have been described as the worst defeat the Iraqi Kurds suffered since 1975. And I couldn't agree more with this assessment. For 15 years now, the KRG could get away with defying the central government and acting as if it were part of, but at the same time apart from Iraq. Because first, the post-Saddam political order imposed on the country by the US occupying force had been constructed in the Kurds' favor. And second, because Iraq, torn apart by partisan divisions and ethno-sectarian strife, had become a dysfunctional state since 2003. But now it is the Kurds who face not only a victorious and emboldened central government, but also an international community who could not care less about their fate since they argue the Iraqi Kurds brought all this upon themselves. In addition now, we have the antagonism between the KDP and the PUK resurfing with a vengeance. So with his brinkmanship, Barzani has gambled away all the Kurds have gained in the past 15 years and they face today a more precarious future than at any point since 1991-1992 when the Iraqi Kurdish de facto state, as it is called, came into being. On the 29th of October then, so two and a half weeks ago, Barzani took personal consequences and announced that he would step down as president of the Kurdistan region. He hopes that with this personal sacrifice he can calm the waters and take Kurdistan out of the firing line, both domestic, international, and regional. But I fear this step will prove insufficient. Nonetheless, this step clearly illustrates the watershed and the dimension of the crisis the Iraqi Kurds face now. Masoud Barzani has led the KDP since 1979, so for 38 years now, and ruled over Abil with short interruptions since 1992. So the dramatic nature of his resignation shows what is at stake now, because it is nothing less than Kurdistan's 
autonomous status at large. And the Kurds are facing the risk of losing everything they have gained in the past 30 years. As I've said, until the referendum, Iraqi Kurdistan was independent in everything but name. And now, a month later, or one and a half month later now, the KRG can count itself fortunate if their autonomous status is merely reduced to something akin of South Tyrol in Italy or the Azores in Portugal. So with this dire assessment, I want to end my talk and hand over to Jenny for the Syrian dimension. Thank you. So I would like to thank you, Professor Quinn, for uh, introducing me and for inviting me to this panel. Uh, today's talk will be about, uh, the title of the talk is The Crisis in Iraq and Syria, non reform and what it means for refugees from this region. So I'll be focusing uh, on the refugee flows coming from Syria. To begin, I will give a little bit of context, uh, some statistics from the UNHCR. Uh, what is non reform and why is it relevant? Uh, some key debates on the principle of non reform and some concluding remarks. So to give a little bit of context, uh, according to the official UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, there's a total number of forcibly displaced persons in the world today amount to 65.6 million as of June 2017. The total number of refugees is 22.5 million, and the total number of registered Syrian refugees is 5.3. Over the Mediterranean Sea, there's over 100,000 sea arrivals to Italy as of November 2017, and the dead and missing has amounted to almost 3,000. These statistics show the great need now to enhance international protection for asylum claimants and refugees, and I suggest that we can start by looking at how non reformal protection should be enhanced. So what is non reformal and why is it relevant? Non reformal as an international law principle is described as the cornerstone of international refugee law protection. It is the pro prohibition against forced removal of asylum claimants or refugees to territories where their life or freedom would be threatened on account of their race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Under international human rights law, it is the prohibition of return to death or torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. The right to seek asylum has little meaning without corresponding protection from reform law. In other words, where an asylum claimant was granted access to territory or to asylum procedures, there must be corresponding guarantee that the individual will not be sent back to persecution, death, or torture. Non reforma is also a right that is guaranteed to both asylum claimants and refugees. Refugee status is declaratory in nature, meaning that uh, national refugee status determination procedures need not have formally taken place in order for a refugee uh, to recognize an individual as a refugee before he or she may be eligible for international protection from reformal. Under international refugee law, non reformal is not absolute, meaning that where an individual is deemed to be a national security risk or a danger to the community of the country of refuge, the individual may be denied ref uh, reformal protection. However, there is a caveat in that despite this exception to reformal, an individual cannot be sent back to torture regardless of the gravity of the crime that he or she has committed. Non reformal is also forward looking in that the country of refuge has a positive obligation of anticipating future risk of harm to the individual seeking asylum as well as a negative obligation of prohibiting return of the individual to persecution, death or torture. Next, I would like to talk about non reformal and its relevance for Syrian refugees. Since refugee status is determined on an individual and case-by-case -case basis, based on an evaluation of an individual's subjective risk, sorry, subjective fear and objective risk from being persecuted, individual f individuals fleeing from generalized violence from armed conflicts or civil wars in a country are not necessarily refugees as defined by the 1951 Refugee Convention. 
This brings into question the situation of mass influx of asylum claimants and individuals seeking refugee status. A country may not have the resources and capacity to deal with a large influx of asylum claimants in a short period of time. The UNHCR has issued a guideline specifically applicable for situations of mass influx, where the co concepts of prima facie recognition of refugee status is clarified. It should be noted that the UNHCR has a mandate to monitor and supervise state compliance with the 1951 Refugee Convention. However, their guidance instruments are not legally binding, but have been applied in practice by states as authoritative. The purpose of the UNHCR guideline is to provide legal interpretive guidance to governments, practitioners, decision makers, and UNHCR staff. Prima facie recognition of refugee status is a group-based recognition of refugees by a country or the UNHCR on the basis of readily apparent objective circumstances in a country of origin, or in this case of stateless asylum seekers, their country of formal habitual residence. In the next section of my talk, I would like to talk about non-refoulement in the European context, specifically two latest developments. The first is the EU-Turkey deal, and the second is Libya and EU Memorandum of Understanding, short for MOU. And then I will talk about the implications on non-refoulement. So first, going to the EU-Turkey deal, uh, under the deal, for every Syrian Turkey admits from the Greek islands, the EU has agreed to take back a Syrian from Turkey. This is called the one-to-one -one scheme. This deal essentially sends back asylum claimants from the Greek islands to Turkey without first examining the merits or substance of their claims. The aim of the EU-Turkey deal is to tackle irregular migration into and across Europe through smuggling activities. I would like to raise three concerns with regards to this EU-Turkey deal. The first concern is that it violates international law and European law on collective expulsion of asylum claimants and refugees. And this is provided for under the draft articles on expulsion of aliens of the International Law Commission. As well, it is provided for under the European Convention on Human Rights, Protocol 4, Protocol 4 Article 4. I wish to emphasize that under European law, any state considering expulsion of a group of non-nationals is required to consider with due diligence and in good faith the full range of individual circumstances that may prevent against the expulsion of each particular individual in the group. The risk of reformant is one such consideration among others. The second concern that I have regarding uh, the EU-Turkey deal is that is EU's presumption that Turkey is a safe third country within the meaning of EU law. Turkey is not a member of the EU and thus is not subjected to safeguards put into place by EU law, namely the safeguards against reformant as, spe as specified under EU law. However, EU may be in breach of indirect reformant where it sends an asylum claimant or refugee to a country deemed safe, but knowing or ought to know but EU knew or ought to have known that Turkey does not have proper asylum procedures in place to process a claimant. The third, and, uh, the third concern that I have regarding the EU-Turkey deal is that Turkey is not known to have proper asylum procedures in place. For example, claimants originating from Syria are accorded a temporary protection under the Turkish Temporary Protection Regulation. This temporary protection regime would mean that applications for international protection will be suspended so that Syrian refugees under the scheme will be precluded from accessing protections granted under the Refugee Convention. This will include a denial of the ability to access the labor market, housing and education as provided for under the Refugee Convention. In September 2017, the Greek Council of State, which is Greek's highest administrative court, has rejected two Syrian refugees' appeals against earlier rulings that their asylum claims are inadmissible. These two Syri Syrian refugees are at risk of being forcibly returned to Turkey. And this case is significant 
because it is the first instance of forcible returns of asylum claimants after the EU-Turkey deal uh, has been signed. And there are concerns uh, echoed by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch regarding this court decision. Amnesty International new findings conclude that asylum claimants and refugees in Turkey are at a greater risk of being returned to their countries of origin. Greece ruling sets a dangerous precedent for future returns of asylum claimants under the EU-Turkey deal. Amnesty International concluded that Greece and the EU should not be sending asylum claimants and refugees back to a country where they cannot get effective protection. Human Rights Watch uh, echoes some of the same concerns of Amnesty International and state that Turkey maintains a geographical limitation to its accession to the Refugee Convention that excludes non-Europeans from refugee status. Non-Syrian asylum claimants in Turkey, including Afghans and Iraqis, are ineligible for temporary protection or basic state services. The next development in, European, uh, in Europe, which I'd <coughs> like to highlight, is the Libya and EU Memorandum of, Un of Understanding, short for MOU. The MOU is signed between the state of Libya and the Italian Republic on February 2017. The aim of the Libya EU MOU is to ensure the reduction of illegal migratory flows and fight against human trafficking and fuel smuggling. Again, I have three concerns regarding the MOU. The MOU between Libya and Italy raises serious, several ser serious concerns regarding both countries' compliance with international human rights law norms, including the principle of non refoulement. Firstly, the MOU permits Libya to violate the principle of non refoulement through collective expulsion of asylum claimants and refugees, leading to heightened potential that these individuals may be sent back to territories where their life or freedom would be threatened. Second is the use of diplomatic assurance by Libya to Italy to accord asylum claimants and refugees with sufficient and proper access to both asylum procedures and to territories may not be adequate leading to potential violation of the principle of non refoulement. In the context of transfer, diplomatic assurance is an undertaking from the receiving state to the sending state that the person being sent will be treated in accordance with international human rights standards. However, I suggest that the Libya-Italy MOU um, and the diplomatic assurance by Libya to Italy uh, does not meet those standards. The third concern I have regarding the MOU is the presumption of Libya as a safe third country, where asylum procedures are not properly in place, creating a heightened risk of refoulement of asylum claimants with a legitimate well founded fear of persecution. So now I'll expand uh, a little bit further on the three concerns that I have regarding the MOU. Uh, another first concern, MOU may permit Libya, although not a contracting party to the Refugee Convention, to violate the principle of non refoulement through collective expulsion of asylum claimants and refugees. Again, as we reiterated earlier for the EU-Turkey deal, collective expulsion of aliens is prohibited by the European Convention on Human Rights as well as the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. In other words, Italy will be in violation of the provision through its pushback operations and the transfer of irregular migrants to Libya on, on the high seas. There are case law by the European Court of Human Rights, which demonstrate that non refoulement would be breached indirectly where collective expulsion takes place without proper examination of asylum applications. This will heighten the chances of the asylum claimant and the refugee being sent back to territories where the life of freedom would be threatened. Under the second concern, uh, is the use of diplomatic assurance from Libya to Italy. According to uh, the UNHCR in its guidance note, any diplomatic assurances from Libya, whether or not Italy chooses to rely upon them, must be assessed in light of the whole state's obligations under international and regional refugee and human rights law, as well as customary international law. Customary international law is evident, evidenced by widespread and uniform state practice and opinion euros, such as statements made by the government. Mm -hmm. 
the European Court of Human Rights held that uh, in a case of Saudi versus United Kingdom, that the sending state is required to examine whether the diplomatic assurances provide in their practical application a sufficient guarantee that the applicant will be protected against ill treatment. The weight to be given to assurances from the receiving state depends, in each case, on the circumstances prevailing at the material time. Relevance upon diplomatic assurances from Libya to Italy, then, would violate, excuse me, I mean, reliance upon uh, diplomatic assurances from Libya to Italy, then, would violate normal form where Italy knew or ought to have known of the deficient asylum system in place in Libya. The third and final concern that I have regarding the MOU stems from the presumption that Libya is a safe third country. A safe third country presumption under EU law presupposes that the safe third country, which is a non-EU country, is a safe destination for asylum claimants and refugees. And it would be a location where EU countries may send these individuals. The safe third country presumption, however, has no basis in international law. And this uh, assertion has been uh, confirmed by the European Con Council on Refugees and Exiles. Presuming Libya to be a safe third country, while in reality no asylum procedures are in place, would mean a heightened potential of asylum claimants with legitimate claims to be rejected, leading to increased risk of refoulement. Furthermore, although Libya is not a, an EU country and therefore is not bound by EU law, Libya is nonetheless bound by customary international law. As normal for has been widely regarded as an international custom, Libya cannot escape its uh, liabilities arising from breaches of the principle, notwithstanding its status as a non-EU country and non-contracting party of the Refugee Convention. In the final section of my presentation, I would like to highlight uh, a key debates on the principle of non formal And the first is the mass influx situations. The myth is that non formal does not apply in situations of mass influx, which is roughly defined as the large-scale arrivals of asylum claimants from situations such as conflict, occupation, mass human rights violations, and generalized violence. In the UNHCR guideline number 11, the UNHCR has clearly emphasized that, in their view, decisions to reject must be assessed on an individual basis, based on their personal circumstance, regardless of whether a group-based recognition process has been initiated by the country of refuge. Some refugee law scholars, such as Jane McAdam, have suggested that non one continues to apply regardless of situations of mass influx, since it would be contrary to the humanitarian objectives of the Refugee Convention which is to offer the widest possible protection to those deserving. Finally, to conclude, I would like to say that the EU-Turkey deal and the Libya-EU uh, MOU have raised serious concerns with regards to EU's compliance with international law obligations, including compliance with the principle of non reformal. Both the EU-Turkey deal and the Libya-EU MOU seems to undermine calls from academics, the UNHCR, and NGOs such as the European Council on Refugees and Exiles for a more concerted effort on the part of European countries to protect the rights of asylum claimants and refugees in the region. While the future of non reform protection in the region remains uncertain, more needs to be done in order to safeguard the rights and freedoms of vulnerable individuals, especially those who would risk their lives to make perilous journeys across the Mediterranean Sea in search of refuge. Thank you. It was interesting that I, to be a part of this, because I wasn't sure how I would fit in, but I got it. I, 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 I am not, uh, I do not have the same, to quote Hannes's word, dire feelings about Kurdish, the future of, of, of Kurdish independence, not independence, but, but shall we say, status quo, perhaps. Um, and what I, want, what I think maybe it would be fun for me to talk about is, is, is that I have a certain optimism about reconciliation between uh, the, the Kurds and, 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 and the Arabs, between Iraq and let's call it Kurdistan. And, and 
I, uh, and I'd like to talk about that because I have a little, I, I, I mean, I see things in a bit more promising light, but one shouldn't be surprised. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about, about much about Syria. I think the Syria thing is kind of done. The rebellion is dead and, you know, Assad will be there for a, a, a rather long time. So I'm gonna talk about Iraq mainly and, and Kurdistan. And <clears throat> I don't think one should be um, too concerned about the fact that I might differ from Hannes's view a little bit because there are paradoxes in, um, in the Middle East. For anybody who's worked there for any length of time or spent any time thinking about it, one thing you have to be very careful about, one you have to be comfortable with, are things that don't fit together, things that don't make a whole lot of sense. And, and, and um, because I've been working there for 20, 25 years uh, on various projects and various issues, I've often been called off wrong. Um, of course, you said pretty much the same thing in the beginning. I think it's very intriguing. And, and it reminded me of, um, this reminded me of, uh, I was an advisor to the UN in, in Baghdad in, in, in 1990, no, much more recently than a couple of years ago, and came across a project. I was trying to rationalize the UNDP program there. I came across a project. You may have heard the NGO called Search for Common Ground. It's an American NGO. Are very soft, sweet, gentle people who believe that conflict can be resolved by getting everybody together and over a weekend and interacting and stuff like that. And so they brought they brought the Turkomans together, they brought the Chaldeans, they, they got they got the they got the Yazidis. I don't think the Yazidis though they're Christians, they're Zoroastrians I think or something like that. And 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 they're all in, and then of course the Sunnis, the Kurds, and so on, so on, so on. And they all had a marvelous time. They ate very well, and and they went back to their different places and were even more conflictual than before. So, I mean, it's not, you know, it always intrigued me. When I, what I said to the people in the Search for Common Ground was, look, you ought to read The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Because there you see Lawrence's extraordinarily difficult effort in trying to reconcile the Arab sheikhs. He succeeded. But in my opinion, he's probably <laughs> the last one who, who succeeded. And it was quite a remarkable thing when you, when you read about Lawrence, you, how, what a remarkable achievement it was because it's so difficult. Um, what I'm going to first say a couple of words about is the rapid decline of Iraq. And that's a very important thing. I was, in, I was there first maybe in 1998. And, and I remember even in 1998, you know, you could get a feeling about what a wonderful country this was and had been in the 1980s, 1970s and 1980s. And, and, and it really was a very debonair place where, you know, you could get kidney transplants in maybe six or seven of the major cities. You could get heart transplants, there was no problem. The hospitals were fantastic. There was a, a reading public that there was no, absolutely no illiteracy. So it was in a very, many ways was a lot like Canada and 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 but by 1998 because the sanctions began in 1991 you began to you could still live the Saturday morning get up go to the hammam have a nice bath you know um, then go have a nice little stroll down the bookseller street maybe you could find an original copy of Lawrence maybe then later have Musgoof on the Tigris and stuff like that. it was really it was really not you could feel that at one time this had been a perfectly reasonable place, but by by the end of the by, by, by the end of the 1990s, though, even though you could feel it, it was long gone. Let me tell you a little bit about the back. And I'm going to I'm going to share with you an anecdote. Because I was then an advisor to the Secretary General on Iraq, and we were trying to come up with things that would work. Um, and um, one of my jobs was to take a look at the levels of nutrition of children because they were rapidly fall, falling. Now let me just recall to you that, um, be, that, 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 that there was no malnutrition before 1990. There was then the invasion by Iraq of, the, of Kuwait. There was then the response of the Americans, the invasion and stuff like that. And what the Americans wanted to do then, they had earlier been very much close to Saddam and what they wanted to do was to completely demolish him. And they retained that position for a very long time until he was gone. And so not only did they defeat him, but they also imposed some very brutal sanctions. And I'm not so sure that people understand 
how serious these sanctions were and whether, because when you hear about sanctions, article, whatever it is, seven in the, in the chart, I mean, it's always a good thing, but it is not. Because in Iraq, sanctions had an unusual impact because of geography. Multilateral sanctions against Iraq worked because, there are not, because there's only five or six ways to get into the country, easily. And so you could easily man all the customs. So there's Jordan, there's to the south, but there's deserts to the west, there's deserts to the south, there's deserts to the north, there's Kurdistan, which was not very friendly at the time, and then there's Iran. So the sanctions worked. And they worked so well that by 1996, 1997, um, there was a great deal of illiteracy, whereas before there'd been none because the schools had closed down. There were kids dying of starvation. There were people who couldn't get um, access to even therapeutic milk. And, 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 it, and it was really quite remarkable. So the United Nations then decided that there needed to be, nobody wanted, the, the Americans would not let the United Nations take off the sanctions. That was out of the question. They wanted to keep the noose around Saddam's neck, but they um, decided there had to be a humanitarian program. And I suppose many of you have heard of the Oil for Food program, I hope. And the Oil for Food program was a United Nations layer upon the sanctions, a humanitarian program that allowed uh, Iraq, to guarantee to Iraq to have certain amount of humanitarian supplies. But it was, let me please assure you, it was one of the most peculiar, unworkable, unthinkable programs I have ever had anything to do with. Um, because it depended upon a few people. I was one of them. <laughs> I moved to New York to do this. I don't know why, but I did it. There was one, depended on a few people in the United Nations to sell all of Iraq's oil, put it in a bank in Paris, and then use the money to contract out the provision of wheat, of therapeutic milk, of um, paper for schools, of cement, and so on, to buy everything that a country of the magnitude of, of Iraq might need. It simply was not possible. And I can tell you, because I reported to the Security Council in those days, I tried to deal with, this, with the nutrition problem. We had to clear everything through the 661 committee, and it was impossible. So, by the end, by, 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 the, by the time I had left the United Nations, out of sheer frustration, and come back to teach here, um, Iraq was an absolute disaster. It, where there had been villages that with, with schools and with hospitals and with clinics and with services, there was nothing. You could see kids were dying. And there was, and, and we're talking about malnutrition, not to the level of stunting or whatever. We're talking about chronic, by that time, chronic and acute malnutrition. So I went around looking for an organization at the level of the government where maybe we would get some assistance, where there had been some expertise on nutrition. It was, didn't exist. The only thing that I could find, and this is why I'm telling, this is the anecdote, is I could find weight loss clinics. Because Iraq, being wealthy and being reasonably well-to-do, the only problem it had to do with food was having too much of it. And it just gives you some sense that even 10 years later, 10 years or, you know, after the sanctions had begun, that it still wasn't, it hadn't even come to terms with the fact that it had been reduced from a state that was very, very affluent to one that was abjectly poor. All right, so one thing that it's very important to understand in the context of this region is how quickly, how rapidly, and how severely Iraq declined. At the same time, let me shift now to Kurdistan, at the same time, the Kurds, who had been treated abysmally by the Iraqis, under, uh, uh, experienced an economic boom. And let me say a word about that, because it's very important to put it in the context of what Hannes has just told you. Um, remember the oil for food program sold the oil and then bought stuff. 
and distributed it. But because the Americans wanted to use the oil for food program to get even or to get revenge against Saddam, anything they could, they decided that of the proceeds from the proceeds from the oil for food program, something like 17 or 18 percent would go to Kurdistan, even though they were only, what, 12, 13 percent of the total population of Iraq. So it was, a very, it, it was completely disproportionate. And so there was surplus in Iraq. There were UNDP, UNICEF, um, FAO, they were, they were swarming over Kurdistan, providing various services. And within, I mean, I'm guessing, I watched it because I went there almost every year, but, but within, a, within a few years, Erbil, which when I first went there in the mid-90s, Erbil, and, and it was nothing, Erbil had high rises, it had beautiful apartment buildings, it had shops, it had malls. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm just remembering that I went there again two years ago and I was in Erbil and I walked into his extraordinary mall selling you know, Gap clothing and the kids all had cell phones. And I just looked at them and I could see, you know, their parents had been in the hills as Peshmerga. And I thought, how weird, how strange. This is an extraordinary, one you of know, these typical paradoxes of this region of the world. Um, and then the bottom fell out uh, to Kurdistan because, uh, for, for a number of reasons. One, the agreement in the Constitution 2005 agreement, the agreement with, with Iraq I mean, was that they would have autonomy, but not only that, they would get a very fixed amount of oil proceeds. Iraq abrogated the agreement. So by, by 2012, I think, or 2013, they stopped paying. Um, uh, in addition, there was the question of the disputed boundary, which had never gotten, res not, never gotten resolved. But the worst of it came when uh, the ISIS, <coughs> speaking of, to Jenny's very interesting talk, that when, when, when refugees began to disappear and began to, began to be chased out, the Yazidis, of course, from Sinjar and, 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 and the Turkoman, and then there was the various kinds of Christians and so on, and they were pushed up into none other than Dahuk mainly to hook, though some in Erbil and some in, and some in Suleimania. So who was going to pay for it? It all fell to the Kurds. So this wonderful economic boom ended up in a disaster. And then the worst of all possible scenarios, oil price fell out, fell through the bottom because the Saudis were using oil and OPEC prices to, as a military weapon against the Russians and pumping too much oil and all of a sudden the, 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 the resources that Kurdistan had fell through the bottom. So by the time we come, but when we come to the present, you know, there had been this roller coaster ride for, for, for Kurdistan. Now I agree that there was internal divisions. And I, you know, you could see, you know, Barzani and Talibani have fought each other for years and stuff like that. But they had reconciled because they were able to do so under this momentary, not momentary, this affluence that was, that was properly theirs. But let me also remind you, and this is something which I always say when I'm talking about Kurdistan, do not ever forget the oppression that Iraq inflicted upon them. The al Anfal campaign, for example, of 1988, when they went around from village to village, took all the grown men and put them into concentration camps. They murdered them systematically. They murdered over 150,000 young men and boys because these were the rebels. Uh, in Halabja, very near the border of, of, of Iran, they gassed them. They actually used chemical weapons, gassed large numbers of Kurds, I think something like 3,000 Kurds were instantly killed and then it, there was all kinds of affection. They were bad, and the Kurds suffered. And they had been doing that for years. So there is not just um, this roller coaster ride, and not just the question of equity in the distribution of oil proceeds. There is a profound hatred of the Kurds toward the Arabs, a profound hatred. Now, there are four. You know, major, this is the Turks, this is the Persians, and there's the Arabs and the, and, and the Kurds. And the Kurds are the only one without a state. 
and the Iraqis and the Arab, Arabs in Iraqi have held it over them. It's not been pretty. So when you, when you talk about Kurdistan, you have to remember that there is such a profound bitterness that they share that someone like me who has in some, because I was there during the, at the end of the al Anfal campaign, and you could see I went to concentration camps so that I could see what the problem was, that someone like me cannot help but when the referendum <laughs> took place, I identified with them. It was very emotive. I said, yay guys, go for it. You know, it's your turn. It, you deserve it. And Barzani did in some ways, even though I know the politics and I know, I know, I know that was a, there, there was betrayal and there was all these terrible history. But the worst of the history was the all Anfal campaign, the murdering of the Kurds, and the, and, and, and the hatred that was generated. All right, now what do we do? Well, there's a very interesting thing, speaking of paradoxes in the Middle East. There's a very interesting thing now. I mean, one has to keep in mind, I do not agree that the situation is all that dire. It will continue. The Kurdistan situation will continue. They will continue to have some kind of relationship with Iraq. They will revise the constitution, perhaps. They will reignite the possibility that there will be the transfer of oil proceeds, and things will continue pretty much as they have been. Um, and I think I totally agree that Barzani overstretched his limits, and he did it for, a very for, for very specific political reasons. But I do not agree that all is lost. Because there's some very strange feature, which Hannes mentioned, there's some very strange feature of this whole thing, which is that everybody opposed it. Now, when you think about that, when you think about the fact that not only, you remember it's landlocked, so there's Turkey, there's Iran, there's Syria, and there's Iraq, not only did all of these, of course, for their own particular reasons, oppose independence for reasons that are more or less, but also their allies, the United States when it comes to Turkey, the Russians when it comes to Syria, who God knows, you know, so, and then the Saudis got involved. So, but everybody agrees, including the Saudis, and that's pretty remarkable, including the Saudis, that Kurdistan should not be independent. How to interpret that? Of course, you could say that, well, that means they had no business of doing it. I think that one will take cognizance of the fact that on this particular matter, on this particular issue, that there is a rare level of agreements and agreement in the Middle East. Everybody is in accord that it's a tragedy, but we're going to oppose them. And it, this is the perfect juncture to get all of these countries together and say, okay, you got, you got what you wanted, but what are you going to do now? And I think they can all agree. What we need, you can't use any of them for mediators, that's entirely out of the question because you know, Turkey has its own interests, it doesn't want you know, to cause foment in its southern district. You know, Iran, of course, doesn't want to weaken Iraq because that's their buddy and so on, so on, so on. There has to be a mediator. And I think that it would be very interesting, and, I, I, and I'm going to close with this consideration. It's very interesting to consider the United Nations as a mediator. Remember, the United Nations was the one who imposed the sanctions against Iraq. So they hate the United Nations. It has a terrible reputation there. UNAMI, those were the inspectors. Those are the ones who said, yes, maybe there is still some nuclear program, and George Bush exaggerated and maybe believed them and stuff like that. But UNAMI has, still has a presence there. And I think that there's a real possibility to begin mediation, to find common ground, to find ways of re resolving the disputed internal boundaries, the DIBs, and show, the, and, and show where there can be some reconciliation about where Kikuk, some of Kikuk, Kikuk's oil can belong to Kurdistan. I think that Turkey's involvement, and in, now that it's just closed the, the, the pipeline, it can reopen the pipeline, once they know that this is going to be a stable situation. So, let me close there. I have a kind of an optimistic view, and um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to share it with you. Do you want this? Yeah,
Okay, we have some time left for questions from the audience. Who would like to go first? Kirsten. So um, according to the UNHCR, uh, an asylum seeker or asylum claimant is someone who is just beginning the process of applying to be a refugee. However, their, um, their formal application has not been accepted. So there will be people who are seeking asylum, however, they have not yet met the definition of a refugee under the convention. So the definition of a refugee would be someone who is uh, fleeing fleeing from a well-founded fear of persecution, who is outside of his or her country of origin, and who is also um, fleeing as a result of uh, membership of a political social group, uh, political opinion, religion, nationality, or race. And also that they're unable or unwilling, the state is una unable or unwilling to provide protection to them. So that definition has to be met. Um, and since refugee status is declaratory in nature, it means that you don't have to go through the national determination process in order to become a refugee. You can meet the definition without having to go through that process, but you have to meet the definition. So I'm not sure if that answers your questions. Yeah, thank you. Can, you, can I just ask a follow-on to that? Sure. Just because I know there are a lot of students in the room, some of them right. from my human rights class. Right. So what's the distinction and, and why does it matter if people meet that threshold? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, so the importance of, uh, of being recognized as a refugee is that you will get more protection under the Refugee Convention. So for instance, uh, you have access to housing, you have access to education, um, uh, resettlement options, uh, and so forth. Uh, but as an asylum seeker, you are not entitled to uh, a lot of the protection that's given to refugees because there's Refugees are considered a special category of persons that are vulnerable, so they're recognized under international law as a special group of individuals. Uh, however, as I've stated before, asylum seekers and refugees both uh, are able to benefit, their f uh, benefit from the protection of reformal, so they cannot be sent back to persecution, uh, death, or torture, regardless of whether they are f uh, meet the definition of a refugee. So. Okay, yeah, thank you, Tosin. Um, let's go back to the maps. Thank you, yeah. Um, to highlight this. There is uh, one thing I, I, I disagree with Jim um, is about the oil revenues. Because this is an issue that has been contested, actually, ever since the Constitution. And the, um, the, the, the proposal put forward in the Constitution 
was that basically Baghdad sells all the oil that is in Iraq, including Iraqi Kurdistan, and gas. And of this, then, Baghdad distributes 17% to the Kurdistan region. So get, they get the money. But Baghdad is in control of the process. And the Kurds have said, ever since 2003, this is unacceptable for us. We want to be in control of our own natural resources. And what they did is they kept illegally selling oil and gas on the international market. And they could do so with the collaboration of Turkey because they used basically the pipeline that goes from Kirkuk um, to the Mediterranean port of Ceyhan in Turkey. And through that pipeline, they sold illegally on the international market oil and gas. That led to the, um, to the incidents, for example, when uh, 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 an oil tanker that was supposed to sell um, Iraqi Kurdish crude uh, in Texas was held by the US Coast Guard for two weeks outside the port of Galveston and was not allowed to sell that oil um, because the Obama administration would to put an end to it. And in 2011, as you mentioned, what happened is that Baghdad said, OK, so we have enough of this. Um, the Kurds are selling oil and gas all the time illegally. We put an end to this. We are not going to give them any money anymore. This is one of the reasons that triggered uh, the economic crisis in Iraqi Kurdistan. Another, I would say, is complete nepotism and mismanagement and, 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 and patronage that is happening there. So basically, um, what Barzani, I would argue, wanted to gain with this referendum is leverage to formalize two important uh, crucial aspects for him. That is, first, the control of the Iraqi Kurds over the disputed territories. This has been disputed ever since the Constitution, the Article 140 of the Constitution that was supposed to address that was never um, implemented, and he wanted to formalize this. The KRG is in control not only of these three governorates, but also um, of basically everything that is pink here. And the second is he wanted that the KRG is in control of its own natural resources. The Baghdad agrees to the fact that they can sell their own oil and gas on the international market. And that it no longer has to go through Baghdad. So basically, he wanted to formalize two things or two aspects the KRG had done anyway all these years illegally. That's in answer to your question what, what, what Barzani wanted to gain. Now, why do I think that the situation is so hopeless now for the Iraqi Kurds? Well, first of all, they've lost 40% of the territory that they controlled since, since 2014. Some of them actually they controlled since 2003. Um, so they are no longer in control of anything that is pink here. Um, including the oil that is in Kirkuk. Also, they are now, that have developed over the last few weeks, they are no longer in control of the main border transit point between uh, Kurdistan and Turkey, through which basically all the traffic in goods, in people, in everything goes. This is the lifeline that connects Iraqi Kurdistan to the world, the Harbour border gate north of Zahro there. Yeah. Um, this is now, this border gate is now manned by both Kurdish Peshmerga and the Iraqi army. So they control now what goes in and out of Kurdistan. They are in control therewith of the Kurdish economy. Same goes for the um, borders with Iran. So of the three factors that basically allowed um, Kurdistan to get away with what they did for the past um, decade or 15 years, namely that they are in control of their own economy, um, they can count on 
the, uh, on Turkey and the US valuing them more than they did Baghdad as a stable ally. And thirdly, that politics in Baghdad is more divided than they are. All these three do not apply now anymore. They are at the moment more divided than uh, the central government in Baghdad, where Haider al-Abadi next year faces a re-election and therefore will um, not be willing to make, make much concessions. They are no longer in control of the economy. They basically have to agree to whatever Baghdad gives them. And second, by um, this brinkmanship of the referendum, as you said, they alienated pretty much everyone um, there is. And everyone rather agrees now, okay, we're not um, putting our eggs in the basket with these uh, troublemakers, but rather set on a stabilizing force of the Abadi government in Baghdad. This is why I'm so pessimistic about the situation, because all the three factors um, that the Kurds had to their advantage for the past 15 years are gone now. So we are sadly out of time. Um, I want to encourage you first to take part in some of the other events that are planned here at Western for International Week. Um, our Western International is here at the front of the room and she's armed with passports and other information for you, so please make sure to see her afterward if you need your passport stamped or anything else. Um, I should also say that an event like this doesn't just happen, and in particular, I want to thank Professor Valerie Osterveld for her help in organizing today's events. I also want to thank the Faculty of Law for its support, uh, as always, for this series, and particularly Susanna Ayers and Corey Meingarten. Thank you. Um, the panel couldn't have happened without our distinguished panelists, and I want uh, to thank Hannes, uh, Cerny, Jenny Poon, and Jim Friedman for their generosity today. Let me also take one more opportunity to plug their books. Um, Jim's um, Disorder in the Court, and Hannes, Iraqi Kurdistan, the PKK and International Relations. Jenny, we'll look for your book soon as well. <laughs> um, and I would like to thank all of you for coming. But before I let you go, let me tell you about our next TJ Center event. Take this opportunity to capitalize on an interested audience. Uh, on Wednesday, the 29th of November, Professor Donna Panay from English and Transitional Justice will be speaking on nationalist pedagogy, Canada's moral advantage and justice work in literary studies. So I'd invite you to join us then and encourage you to visit our website at tjcenter.ca for details of all of these and other events. But for now, will you join me one last time in thanking all three of our speakers.